Hey, this is Rick Casales from ExercisesForInjuries.com. Today, I have another interview for you, and we're going to chat about, about supplements and, you know, the pros and cons when it comes to supplements, and we'll go, we'll go into, um, we'll kind of highlight a couple supplements and probably challenge a couple of the beliefs and thoughts you have when it comes to supplements and probably some of the supplements you're taking right now. So I will get Sol to introduce himself uh, and then we'll go into the interview. So, hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Solid from Examine.com, and uh, basically my my you know my pathway into this is a little bit different than most people's. Uh, you know, I retired about five, six, seven, eight years ago, and I traveled around, and I was in Argentina for a while. And let me tell you. When you can order online uh, ice cream delivery, you know, you get a liter of ice cream within 10 minutes, uh, it's, it's hard not to stay in shape or it's hard to, you know, uh, not get fat. Uh, and then I moved to Manhattan after that and I lived right above a bakery. And, you know, when you wake up and you're smelling cookies just wafting into your, into your apartment, it's hard not to want to go get some. So by the time I got back to Toronto, I was pretty much very well out of shape. And as I got into shape, uh, you know, I have a very analytical mind, so I started taking notes on what works, what doesn't work. And I was very frustrated that there wasn't a reference site or like a Wikipedia specifically for health and fitness in terms of, you know, the notes I was taking, like ghrelin and hormones and supplementation and nutrition. And that's kind of what got me started into this business or into this industry, really. Um, we basically, we've been at it for two and a half years now. Uh, we have over 20,000 uh, references as to our claims between behind supplements and nutrition. And basically, we're just building a reference site on as to what works and what doesn't work. Awesome. And that's kind of the gist of it. Okay, cool, cool. And then, so, go, you know, jumping into the questions when it relates to supplements. So what, you know, what are, what are some mistakes when people, what, what are some mistakes that people are making when it comes to buying supplements? Because I know... How it is is people will watch TV or they'll read a magazine, they'll talk to a friend, and a friend will say, "Hey, you should take this supplement for, or, or you should take the supplement for whatever." And then they go to the grocery store and buy something. So, what mistakes are people making when it when it relates to buying supplements? To be honest, I think it's a part of human nature where you hear about some supplement or some pill and you take it, and and, and you'll be much better and whatnot. Uh, the reality is that you know most of them are marketing, and every time you hear an exotic supplement, I'm sure you'll hear in the media, you know, some supplement's going to help you lose your fat and all this kind of stuff. And the reality is that you have to be extremely skeptical about these kind of claims, right? I mean, you can you can make a legitimate claim, but still kind of hide it so it doesn't really work. So my favorite example is glutamine, right? Glutamine is sold as a muscle builder, and uh, it it does build muscle, but if it can only get to the actual muscle cells. The reality is when you actually ingest glutamine, it, your intestines love it and they sequester it for themselves. So glutamine is amazing for intestinal health, but it doesn't really help with growing muscles. And so when you go buy supplements, I mean, unless you know specifically what you're looking for, um, it's really easy to get suckered into the exotic, the esoteric or whatnot, and it just sounds really amazing. So, you know, honestly, the old adage of, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it likely is, and you should apply that exact same of reasoning when it comes to supplements. Okay. Okay. And if you go to the grocery store and you're kind of wandering through the pharmacy and you're looking at supplements, is there a difference when it comes to the quality? You've got one that's like super expensive, one that's medium range, one that's no name brand. Is there really a difference when it relates to the quality of supplements? Quality is kind of a hard one to dictate, right? I mean, the manufacturing processes tend to be in China and whatnot. They all seem to come from the same places. I mean, the general truism of, you know, more expensive means better quality tends to exist in all markets, right? And we can apply the same to supplementation. But the reality is, of course, companies know this too, right? So they know you're looking for something more expensive, so they, you know, they increase their price a little bit. You come across some impressive, uh, you know, designs and whatnot. You think, okay, you know, this is high quality. Um, at the end of the day, to be honest, the simplest way to know if it's a, a legitimate brand is the FDA actually does issue citations against supplementation companies. I mean, the FDA gets regularly bashed for not doing enough, you know, in terms of looking over supplements and whatnot. But the reality is, you know, there's actually a congressional bill passed that lets supplements make these claims. So what the FDA does do is it looks for the quality of products. So honestly, if you're looking at some brand. 
Um, consumerlab.com is a good website too to look up. They do their own testing. But if you just go to Google and you search for FDA plus the company name plus you know recall, citation, problem, anything like that, if they've ever had a problem, it'll show up. And if they don't, then you can reasonably expect it to be, uh, you know, to be of a decent manufacturing process. I mean, some of them will call, you know, claim ISO 9001, stuff like that. I mean, you kind of have to figure out if that, if that matters to you or not. Oh, in, I didn't. That's awesome. The FDA thing was very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, a little bit underrated. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And so you kind of touched on, but if we're you know shopping through the grocery store and we're looking at supplements, there, you know, if something's more expensive compared to something that's cheaper, it kind of reflects it being better right. quality it, or. Yeah, it reflects quality, but it also can also reflect purity, right? So an easy example is fish oil. Right, some some pill may say it has one one thousand milligrams of fish oil, right? And you think, oh, you know, that sounds pretty legitimate. But you actually look at the label, and, and the only part of fish oil that really matters is the EPA and DHA, right? So if those two combine for only three hundred milligrams, basically you're getting seventy percent filler, right? So that's a large part large part of purity too, right? I mean, of quality and the prices, you know, how pure is the product? So if someone's claiming one thousand IU vitamin D versus five thousand IU vitamin D, right? It depends on that. Too. So you should obviously look at the label and you should actually see how much of the active ingredient that you're interested in is actually there, right? Fish oil is the easy one to say because you look at Centrum and all those brands and oh, it's like, oh, you know, it's so cheap for so many milligrams of, for so many, uh, for so much fish oil, but you actually look at the purity and it's pretty much garbage. I mean, I, I hate to pick out Centrum specifically, but just because of how popular it is, right? So uh, you look at other brands of fish oil, which are higher in, I mean, fish oil, fish oil is pretty easy too because of the processing, pretty much all the contaminants are gone anyway. Um, but you look at the actual label, and I'll show you the EPA, DHA, and you can kind of glean from the purity to be a reflection of the quality of the product too. Awesome. Okay. And so, ta so looking at supplements, like what are some supplements out there that are that are overrated, that are kind of pumped up and don't really are, don't really have that much effect on the body? Uh, honestly, you could almost say uh, almost all athletic supplements are quite overrated. Uh, and, and that comes from, you know, considering that's what we do, we use the supplementation. Uh, but the obvious ones for a rated one, would, one would be definitely glutamine that I mentioned earlier, right? I mean, we have these petri dish studies showing that it's amazing for muscle synthesis, but the moment you actually try to ingest it, you know, the actual human processes get in the way. Uh, another one that's really overrated would be TRIB and even in general most testosterone boosters. I mean, these herbs, uh, it's, a, it's a false connection, right? You, you feel like your testosterone is up, so you feel like your libido is higher. But what these testosterone boosters often do is they increase your libido, but there's actually no testosterone boost associated with it, right? So it's a false positive, right? You feel like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so jacked up, I'm going to do amazing, but sorry, it's a biological process going on inside you. Uh, those two would be the primary ones. The third one that we do like to pick on is glucosamine. Uh, glucosamine is one of those where 10% say it works amazing and 90% say it's useless. Um, and even then, only glucosamine hydrochloride doesn't actually have any evidence that it works, and it's only glucosamine sulfate that has any evidence. And so it's very possible that it's actually a red herring that the glucosamine is working, or, and what's actually happening is that you're deficient in sulfate, and getting that excess sulfate group through glucosamine is what's actually helping you. Right? So MSM and chondroitine, which are the other two popular joint uh, pain relievers, they actually also have sulfate with them. So it's very possible that, again, it's more of a reflection of a bad diet, like glucosamine or any of these other work. Um, and the same thing with the testosterone boost, if we go back to that for a second, right, where we all have a baseline of testosterone. And if you're deficient in stuff like magnesium or zinc, you'll fall below your baseline. And then so now if you're taking these testosterone boosters that have zinc, sure, your testosterone is increasing. But it's more of a reflection of a poor diet and it's just taking you back to baseline than actually doing anything to boost you above where you should have been normally anyway. Okay. And then, so then we talked about supplements that are kind of overrated. You know, what supplements are underrated or people are not taking enough of? So vitamin D is an obvious one, right? It's, it's gained a lot of press in the past few years that, you know, hey, we should be taking vitamin D. Uh, the backstory is most of these vitamin uh, RDIs, you know, the recommended daily uh, in intake, is based on disease states. So vitamin D was at 400 IUs because it's what it's how much you need before you uh, so you don't get rickets, 
right? So vitamin D now, the general recommendation is about a thousand or two thousand I use because there's a lot of, you know, there's a there's a minimum intake and there's an optimal intake, right? And the optimal intake has a lot of, you know, it helps with bone health and all these other kind of hormonal processes, right? It even affects your testosterone levels. Um, and an easy way to compare where you think, hey, you know, minimal versus optimal is protein, right? You need a minimum of 50 grams of protein a day, but obviously the, the optimal amount is, is slightly higher than, than 50 grams of protein. And the other interesting one in terms of that we're underdosing is vitamin K. So vitamin K's RDI is about 100 micrograms, and it's based on not getting, uh, not having problems with hemorrhaging, right? So as long as your blood clotting fine, then you don't need more vitamin K. But if we actually go to about 1,000, that's where some nice stuff happens, where, you know, you, you may have heard of arterial stiffness or arterial calcification, where your arteries kind of harden in some way. So vitamin K actually helps alleviate that stiffness and actually has a huge also part of uh, helping with bone health. So that's kind of where the where vitamin D, vitamin K would be the two uh, underdose. You need a minimum that's not hard to get, but to get to the optimal dose of those two is admittedly really hard. I mean, vitamin D, you know, you go out in the sun and that's where you get your exposure, but it's not just your face, right? You have to expose your skin. And most people are covered, they're wearing a t-shirt, they're wearing jeans or shorts. I mean, that little bit of leg and that little bit of arm in your face, that's not enough to actually generate enough vitamin D that you need, right? That's why we supplement. And vitamin K, pretty much the only way to get vitamin K reliably is through kale. And not just kale, but blended kale. If you actually have kale itself, like normal, the cell structure is so rigid that the bioavailability of vitamin K is actually pretty poor. So you actually have to blend kale to be able to say, I'm getting enough vitamin K, you know, to get the optimal dose, not the minimum dose. So those are the two that uh, I do recommend. Uh, the third, though, if I do want to add it, and I kind of do, is uh, creatine. I actually make my mom take it too. Uh, it's completely safe. All the worries about kidneys and all that are completely overblown. Um, and you know, in the simplistic manner, vitamin uh, sorry, creatine is extra energy for your cells, and so it has a cell protective effect on it. Um, so I recommend to everybody take creatine. It's extremely cheap. You know, you take your monohydrate, micronized if you want to. to uh, dissolve a bit better. You don't need pills or any of the specialized creatine nitrates or any of that other garbage. Take your monohydrate. It's literally like 10 bucks for six months supply. And all it does is it helps your cellular function. So those are the three I would I would state are, are underdosed uh, for us normally. Very cool. Interesting. Now, you've, you and your team uh, at your site have put together an amazing supplement reference guide. So maybe you can kind of talk about how you guys came up with this guide because it's it's not just your guys' opinion. I mean, you guys have done a fair bit of research to kind of back everything that's in this monstrous guide. Yeah, so we've been at it for two and a half years now. And we basically, uh, you know, we're pretty, we're extremely proud of our, our independence, our neutrality, and being unbiased. We have no affiliations. We have no supplement, excuse me, we have no supplement brand. We don't sell any supplements. We're kind of external to that entire industry of fitness. And so while I kind of bashed on supplementation in terms of, uh, you know, athletics, because, you know, other than creatine and caffeine, none of it really works, maybe bed alley a little bit. Um, and while I said, you know, there's only a few that we're underdosing in terms of gener generalities, uh, the reality is that supplementation can actually be pretty potent depending on your health context. So my favorite example, and there's other doctors now who are starting to actually prescribe it, is berberine. So berberine, you know, if you're diabetic, uh, blood sugar is extremely important to you, right? You have to keep it under control. And berberine has been found to be as potent as metformin, which is the number one prescription drug for diabetics. So I have a few diabetic friends, uh, you know, juvenile and, and type 2, and they're on berberine and they absolutely love it. Like, it, it helps open up things for them. It's a lot cheaper than prescription drugs and whatnot. And that's kind of our viewpoint on supplementation is, hey, you know, if you have very specific cases, and, and specific cases being whatever your health goal is, right, um, there are supplements that can help you, and there are supplements you have to be careful of, right? So, for example, caffeine increases your blood pressure. So if we already have high blood pressure, and you've had a really, you know, stressful day at work or whatnot, you got yelled at by your boss and whatnot, the last thing you want to do is you want to grab a cup of coffee, right, or you want to grab tea, right? You want to make sure you get decaf instead because there's absolutely no reason to pile more stress onto your already 
high blood pressure, already even more higher because of the stress and anxiety, and now you're having caffeine, like that's, that's a recipe for disaster, right? That's not a good idea. So what we've, what we've built um, you know, over these past one and a half years is more, more of a it's kind of a conclusion to all of our research, and it's ongoing to be honest, is we've looked at human studies, and we're talking about inside humans, right? Going back to the glutamine example where cells versus actual human bodies. And we've about or like 2,100 human studies we've looked at, and we've got about 190 different health goals. And so, based on your health goal, we'll say, hey, you know, if you are stressed, for example, and my last month has been pretty stressful for, for me, uh, something called rhodiola, which is an adaptogen and therefore is an anti fatigue agent, you know, it would be helpful. So now that I'm not stressed out anymore, I don't need to take rhodiola anymore, right? So. We built this guide so you look up your health goals, you look up what issues you have to worry about, what issues you don't have to worry about, and then at that point you can find out, hey, you know, are there supplements I should take and are there supplements I should be afraid of? And um, the other thing I say is, you know, if you look at our testimonials page, uh, you know, again, we've been external to the market, uh, to the industry, but, you know, from doctors to nutritionists to researchers, PhDs, fitness trainers, everyone, even people who've got protein recipe websites. They're all huge fans of, uh, of our work and it's all transparent, right? We will say, here's the specific studies that say this, here's the demographics, here's the information, here's what they found, and if there's any problem whatsoever, I mean, we're very transparent, so, uh, so that's kind of what we built. We're very proud of it, uh, but uh, we, we feel like we built something very legitimately useful. Awesome. And then, so we're near the end of the interview. Do you have any last-minute tips or things that you want to leave with the viewers, listeners, or readers? I uh, actually, the, the number one supplement I do recommend is sleep. Uh, <laughs> it's it's amazing to me how you know some will go out, get drunk over the weekend, you know, get three hours of sleep a night, and then come to me and say, "Hey, you know, how can I make my life better?" And it's sleep is by far the greatest, bestest thing in the world there is. Uh, and it's not just sleep, though. It's also the quality of sleep, right? You don't want stimuli coming on, right? If somebody knocks on your door while you're asleep, you're going to wake up, right? Your brain is always awake. So don't fall asleep with the TV running. Don't fall asleep with music or distractions. If you need ocean sounds or something soothing, that's fine. But fall asleep in quiet periods. Fall asleep where it's dark, light, you know, light messes up melatonin production, which is important for staying asleep and whatnot. But yeah, get your sleep. I mean, seriously, even more than nutrition now, I recommend people get their sleep right and then kind of worry about everything else. Awesome. So that, that's my recommendation on that. <laughs> oh, yeah, Sol. So where can people get more information about you and, and the guide? Uh, I'm sure under this video you'll have a link for them, and you know they can just follow that. Our website itself is examine.com. Pretty easy to remember, but just click those, li those links, and it'll be a lot easier to make it happen. Awesome. So thank you very much for your time, Sol. All my pleasure. And thank you very much, Exercises for Injuries viewers, readers, and listeners. This is another interview for you. Now, if you haven't visited exercisesforinjuries.com, swing by there, enter in your injury or pain. There's a good chance that I have an article, video, um, or an interview that will help you out. Uh, second thing, if you're watching this on YouTube, head up above, hit subscribe. What that will do is every couple days you'll get an interview like this or a video where I chat about injury in pain or a guest video from one of my friends in the health and fitness uh, niche other one last thing head down below hit like and leave Sol and I a comment or a question and we'll do our best to answer you so that's it this is uh, Rick Casselge and Sol saying take care and bye bye <laughs>